Welcome to Evolving Educators. I'm Donda Slayton. I'm a campus administrator in New Caney ISD, and I have my producer here, Chris Hurst. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Donna. It's so nice to be back here with you it's today. It's always glad to see you. How's everything going? It's going really well. Um, it's another great weekend, and now we're here filming. Absolutely. I can't wait um, to get started today because it is an amazing guest that we have. So this was a surprise. I asked him to please, please uh, be on our podcast, and he was very happy to accept. So this was a awesome. great thing. He is going to talk to us about things that our new leaders need to really hone in on to be an effective leader and to make that good start to the school mm -hmm. year. And so this guy is the author of two books. He is a coach. He is um, a professional coach not like sports, a yeah. professional coach. And he has coached me mm -hmm. several right. times. He coaches leaders in our district. He has even coached Christy Schaffner. And so who am I talking about? I think you're talking about John Wink. I am talking about John Wink. So we are so excited to have yeah. such a guy like him on our podcast. This is going to be a really cool one. This is going to be amazing. And he will have a lot of insight for us. And I can't wait for this episode, Chris. I can't either. When we come back from the break, we're going to get this party started. And welcome back. We are here with John Wink. We are so excited to have you, Mr. Wink, uh, at, for this episode. You're always welcome at New Caney ISD, and you have taught us so much through the years. We're really glad you're here. Thank you, Dr. Sladen. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Awesome. So today, we're just going to start talking about just essential skills to being a great leader. And one of the things we've really narrowed down to um, from, from you, John, is there are three essential skills for an aspiring leader that they need to master in order to be successful their first year. Right, and I think that if you're gonna be a successful leader in anything that you do, so it doesn't matter if you're a leader here at school, you're a leader at home, you're a leader in your church, uh, the number one thing is you have to be organized. And organize, organization is extremely critical to be successful in any endeavor. If you're not organized, it really doesn't matter about the other stuff, you're not gonna be very helpful there. Um, the second thing that I think is real important, and often we put that first, is we think that you gotta be a good communicator. What I have found is that if you're not a really strong communicator, if you are a strong communicator, but you have poor organization, your communication often gets tuned out because they know you say what you mean, but you actually don't mean what you say. So you, you kind of lose credibility. Absolutely. Yes. You're, every, every interaction gains credibility, loses credibility. And so, you have, and so the number one thing that actually builds your credibility is can you deliver without even saying anything? So organization is the fundamental thing that must be in place for you to be a successful leader. Communication also is not just the words that you say. Sometimes it's the communication that you use that doesn't require any type of conversation whatsoever. Um, and so that's a really important thing. And then the final thing is, is how well can you support people? Are you an intuitive supporter? Do you have to be told to support? Um, is it uncomfortable for you to support? Because at the end of the day, leadership is not about title. It's not about position. It's not about authority. It's about can you guide, serve, and influence people? And the key word right there that brings all those three words together is support. If you don't know how to support people, you don't know how to serve. And so that makes you very, it makes it very difficult for you to lead. Yes. And John Maxwell says, if no one's following you, are you really a leader? Right. So you got to sure. make sure you have followers, right? And part of that comes with the support, all three of these things. Let's go back to organization. Sure. So the reason this sticks with me, Chris, remember we've had another, Stephanie Coronado has yeah. spoke a great deal about organization she and sure things. Did. So what are some ways a new leader could just set up themselves organizationally? Because you're talking about foundational, not organization as in the thought of the school, right. but organization as in literally what, how do I keep myself together day well, to if day, you, right? Yeah, I, for me, organization starts with yourself. It starts with how well you organize your personal life before you even get to the school. Um, if you're not organized in your personal life, that's going to transfer into your professional life. Um, you see a lot of people who have a lot of talent, but they fall uh, from that high pedestal. And the thing that brought them down was their lack of personal organization, so their this character lack, and yes, things this, of that nature. This lack of organization will 
also get you off step. Don't you think it's almost like that checklist? Um, if you are not organized with step one, step two, step three, you're jumping all over the place, aren't you? Well, the key, the key, I think, of when I think of organization, it's really found in the habits that you establish. And the more habits sure. that you have as a leader in how you wake up in the morning, how you get yourself ready in the morning, um, the more habitual you are in your actions, uh, the more that's going to translate into your leadership. And so it's going to be more intuitive, more natural for you to lead because you're not dedicating so much brain power to thinking about what you need to do Absolutely. because you've got so much habit built into your life. Yes. You know, Jonathan Powell talked about, right. he eats breakfast, the same breakfast every, every day. day. Yeah. And then, so not taking, taking the cognitive load off those little things right. so that you can commit to what you, you really gotta, are doing. Got to save your brain power. Well, yes. that's the key. And, and you know, the brain is always searching for survival. It's searching for certainty. Mm -hmm. So what you as a leader need to do is you need to make sure that you have as much of your life in, in order as possible. So that way you do have a cognitive load ready to go to mm -hmm. towards your professional work and towards building relationships and how to communicate through difficult times and things of that nature. Right. So do you have any suggestions for how we could organize ourselves? Well, I think if, uh, you know, obviously how you organize your personal life is very important. How you organize your relationships with your spouse, with your children, that's important. But I do believe that if you want to be a, if you want to be seen as a leader in the school, it really boils down to how do you organize yourself as a teacher? Are you seen as a very organized person? Do you organize your time well? Do you waste your conference time or do you have a strategic purpose for each conference that you have in your day? If you have order in your professional life and you have order in how you get work done and how you respond to students, it's, it's almost the action reaction and you're creating these habit loops that are occurring that one habit leads to another that leads to another. You're going to establish, establish yourself as a strong person of character, which at the end of the day, people follow character more than they follow titles. So really I would say build organization in your character. And then the second thing is how do you build organization and how you interact with your team? How do you interact with your leaders? How do you support your leaders when other people are not supporting your leaders, even though when they should be followed. So it's really organizing your responses to people when they're not so positive. Organization is the key to everything. Yes. You know, one of the things on my need to read list for our aspiring leaders is both your books, Guide to Excellence. I think even as a leader, I've read the teacher Guide to Excellence. And I think that's important for a leader because you always need to be looking through that lens of a teacher. Right. Sure. But really what I hear you saying though, John, about organization, that's one of the layers of your pyramid, yeah. which is processes, procedures, those types of things. So that can come over into the classroom, but also personally yeah. and, and professionally for us. It's basically organization is aligned to the structure for learning categories, the re resources for learning and the routines and procedures. Yes. If you build organization, you'll have structure in your life, you'll have structure in your relationships. Yes. And you know, you I, I know this isn't your quote, but I've heard you say it many times. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so it's part of that one. organization is so important. Well, and a lot of times people don't dedicate time to planning for themselves. You know, you think about it, we're so, as leaders, we feel like we got to meet everybody's needs, but sometimes we do that at, at the expense of meeting our own needs. And so sure. building organization for you to meet with yourself and to plan and to organize is so important. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be seen as a very effective leader. Yes. You know, I, um, I myself, I'm very organized and planned. And I find it really helps my self-care component. Mm -hmm. you know, it helps my yeah, anxiety. Absolutely. I'm not worrying oh, yeah. about things. And so I think more than ever, that's probably the biggest takeaway that you need. If you're organized and establish yourself as an organized person, it's going to make you feel better about what you're doing, right. don't you think? At the end of the day, if you're in routine, your stress level is, is lighter. When you're out of routine... You know, any time that I'm not doing something the normal way I do it, my anxiety yes. increases subconsciously. Yes. And so that's really important. When you notice that your stress is elevating, that should be an indicator, just like a warning light on your car dashboard, that you're really out of routine and you need to figure out what is causing that problem. How do I fix it so I can be more productive? Yes, I love that. Let's move on to communication. That's one of those things, no matter what Ms. Schaffner asked me, my goals are. I always add communication as a third, you know, third component. It might even be second component. When I was a first year principal, it definitely was a first year. But let's talk about communication 
I mean, it's so multifaceted. Yeah. How can we get a handle on communication and being an effective communicator? Well, um, as a what I will call prolific pontificator, and that's what I am. I speak, I talk a lot. I would say that my biggest deficit with communication, and I would say that falls in with most people, is the deficit with communication really falls into two categories, not recognizing the nonverbal cues you're sending to people, and then number two, not listening. Because a lot of times we listen ready to say the next thing, when we really need to listen to really hear the person and to be reflective with the person. Because as a leader, sometimes we're so quick to give an answer and we're conditioned to be a helper. Yes. So we're conditioned to give quick answers, quick fixes. And so a lot of times we miss the mark on communication. I would say that that's personal, you know, the, the personal communication that as a leader you got to develop. Does your face communicate that you want to communicate with that person? Does your dress communicate that you want to meet with that person? And I talk a lot about that in my Elevate Your Own Leadership course, is that how are you, what's your plan to ha have strong communication? The second part of communication is actually not communication whatsoever. It's the systems that you that communicate in place of you, you know, and, and I talk about that in my C4 Before Me process, yes. level one on resources for learning, you know, that the purpose of C4 before me is to create a structure that communicates in place of the teacher. And so with that, with that piece, you got to start thinking, what, is, what communicates in place of you? What systems do you have that communicate to people when they have a question so they don't even have to ask you a question? That can be your website. That can be the emails that you send out. You know, if, if you think about it, if you want to be a strong communicator, you need to be regular. You need to be predictable. You need, and, and also you need to communicate how people can solve problems without even talking to you. Because really what people think communication is, is talking. And really it's not. It's the sending and receiving information. But we have a lot of people that talk so much that they don't send information. And sometimes they so, say so many words that when they do send that message, it is so complicated and so overwhelming that the person can't possibly receive it because it exceeds the listening capacity and the reception capacity of that person. Yes. Sure. Yes, that's so important. I love what you said about, uh, reminded me when you said C4 before me. One of the things we talked about, uh, you know, at the campus I'm currently at is I used, I love your list and links of things that, because a lot of times, uh, teachers are sitting on their couch watching the basketball game. Yep. They have their laptop open and they just have a question. It might be, um, oh, I wonder, you know, what period attendance is, or mm -hmm. I wonder how I call in for an absence. I wonder how I send a student to the nurse. I mean, those are things we really shouldn't be wasting time on. Those are, that should be this common hub. Yeah. And, and that's why in my website, I have links to everything. So, yes. because I don't want people to feel like they need to reach out every time they have a question. That's why I create a website to create resources for you. But honestly, that communicates in place of me. Right. So the leaders one stop shop. Hey, where do I find that? Poke around and find the link there in my communication that I always send out. I always have hyperlinks to things. Why? Because the link links learning for the people you're trying to communicate with. So hyperlinks in your virtual communication are so important. It's right. also real important for your parents. If you want parents to really see you as a strong leader, they need to see how you and your office staff and your mass communication communicates things to them that answers questions that solves problems. At the end of the day, people will communicate more with you if they see you as a resource that solves their problems. People won't communicate with you or will avoid communicating with you if they see you as the problem. So that's a real important thing to consider in communication. Are you solving problems? Or are you creating them with your communication? Oh, that's so true. Yeah. You know, it really, though, links back. These th I'm starting to see how these three things are really interconnected. They are. I mean, if you, communication comes back to being organized. Mm -hmm. And so if you're organized and well thought out right. about how you're going to communicate, then the message it becomes more clear, don't you think? Right, and and so I think we need to say more, and I mean, say less and communicate more. And so, you know, the thing that I will say is that I have been known to send a very lengthy email with lots of lots of information, but if you think about it, you don't want your emails to be seen as the more post alert on Facebook. You know, on Facebook, sure. we see more uh, long post alert. What do we do? We scroll past it. I don't want people scrolling past my communication. And so the way you do that is you have to make it concise, precise, 
advice and link to the things that are super duper important because people will keep coming back to your communication if you solve their problems quickly and efficiently. And you know what you've said to me many times that I love and it's really stuck with me, John, it's helping the staff and you communicate, okay, this is a need to know and a have to know. Yep. So it's those things, yes, I know that maybe I'll come back to that tomorrow, mm -hmm. but I love what you say about thinking of communication in what is my need to know and have to know. At the end of the day, people uh, want to know, hey, John, what do you want me to do? And if I can give them that answer as quickly as possible and they can synthesize it and turn it into action, they're going to keep coming back because they see my communication as a resource, not as a something to resist. I love that, a, a resource. And it reminds me of a workflow. Yep. I mean, it goes back to organization, but like this workflow of I have this question, I go here. Um, I may need Sladen for that. I may yep. need John for that. Right. But it's so systematic that it really takes all the guesswork out of it. I love that. Well, let's move on to support. First of all, I mean, just like communication, that's kind of a range of, of things. What does support mean in the school setting for a new leader? Well, in my books, I talk about creating a support system. So for principals, they got to create an excellent support system for teachers. For teachers, they need to create an excellent support system for students. And so there, it's a three-step approach. Um, and I outline all of those things in, in each chapter of the book is step one. It's really a, pro a progression. Step one, it's just like the classroom. What do you want all the students to know? What do you want all the teachers to know? And so your first step is professional learning or learning, teaching everybody what they need to know. And if you're going to be a principal, you need to be the principal. You need to be the teacher of teaching, the instructor of instruction. So step one, we provide professional learning it to to everybody. Right. Step two is what everybody needs is learning without you. And that is step two is collaboration. Teachers need time to collaborate without the leader. You know, students need uh, time to collaborate without the teacher. And so that's really important. And then step three is real simple. It's individualized instruction. So that's where your coaching comes in. And, 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 and a lot of times we as leaders get that backwards. We go straight to the individual and start working it down the line. But the reason we're going to each individual is because we didn't provide the professional learning first. And a lot of times we we probably over support when we just need to create teams that work and learn together to solve their own problems. At the end of the day, when teachers work and learn together to, to solve their own problems, guess what they start doing? They start becoming more self-reliant and they also become better because they're sharpening each other. The best form right. of professional learning doesn't involve the leader at all. So yes. how are you creating an environment where learning is, is really occurring with everybody? You know, that reminds me of Dr. Susan Mesmer's uh, yeah. self-efficacy Absolutely. And so these types of things, when peers can be with peers, groups, and teams can grow, right. that grows their self-efficacy and, and their belief in their self. Yeah. I love that. And so um, how important do you think it is to tier the teachers at the beginning? I, Well, I think tiering people is what you should do anyways, and not as a negative connotation. I, I think people get a little frustrated when you think, well, how do, why do we put this one at a tier one and this one at a tier two? At the end of the day, we need to know every, we need to know every student by strength and struggle. Mm -hmm. We need to know every teacher, every leader by strength and struggle. That's what I, I was thinking, Chris. Really, this goes back to if you were a strong teacher, mm -hmm. some of these are applicable to your leadership, right, John? Absolutely, yes. yeah. Well, and here's the other thing is that I need to, I think we need to stop thinking that a struggle is a bad thing. Yes. Every one of us struggles with something. And so if we're going to grow people, we meet them, we meet them at the, where their strength and their struggle separate. And we start with the strength to overcome the struggle. And, and when you do that, you create an environment where struggle is a good thing, not a bad thing. Yes. I mean, that's where growth comes from, yeah. really. Is It doesn't come from strength. No, no. And it also, I, I think as the leader, believing that the people are there. I mean, we don't sign, we know, John, we don't sign on for this. Yeah. For, I mean, we want to make a difference. We want to improve Absolutely. people's lives. Right, Chris? And so we've talked about that before. But And so assuming people are there for the right reasons, um, also helps with support. Mm -hmm. So it's not about getting someone or take it, it. It is about growing them and growing their craft. Wouldn't Absolutely. you say? Absolutely. Yeah. At the end of the day, we, it, it, we all have the potential to grow. The question is, is how vulnerable can you be to grow the most? And so that's really what it's all about is creating a culture where vulnerability um, is an asset, not a yes. liability. And we leverage into people's uh, strengths to overcome their struggles. And so that's really where we're trying to go. Yes. And you know, part of that, um, um, the leader, the new leader could help those teachers by also um, explaining their goals 
and learn and, and talking about things they're working on. Don't you think that would well, help? I think too? I think if you want a campus to really embrace growth, I think the leader should be the first person that says, I need to grow and here's yeah. where I'm working to grow this year. And then giving followers permission to support you in growth. If you right. are really wanting to that. grow in communication, tell people up front, I want to go in communication. These are the two things I'm working on. Will you please give me feedback? And when people have permission to give feedback, growth is, it's like fertilizer. I mean, growth is going to be almost certainty. That's awesome. It also comes down to what you just said with support is making sure that the leader is coachable. Yep. And so, of course, we want the teachers to be coachable, but that comes with the relationship building, uh, just like the students, right? Absolutely. And so the, the, t- the leader being coachable is very important. I love it. So model what we what we want to see. Yeah. Don't you expect what you don't expect of yourself. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you. John, I've enjoyed. I'm it's been so, a great time. Enjoyed visiting with you. I am so excited to see you. So I want uh, you to check out John Wink's book, Guide to Excellence for Teachers and Guide to Excellence for Leaders. He has a blog I'm fond of. I like to read. You yeah. haven't written in a while? I haven't. I took a break this summer. Oh, so, well, that's okay. uh, yeah, if you go to my website, winkedlearning.com, I always try to find some stuff. I've got one in the in the, in the the hopper, but I haven't finished it yet because I've been busy this summer. It's been been pretty busy. That's I okay. So, we're really glad that you're here and, and agreed to come and Thank speak with so us. Much. Our leaders Absolutely. are going to benefit so much from this. Sure. And, and even we the feel like you're, yes, we feel like you're um, part of the family anyway. Thank you. I, so. I, I enjoy working with New Caney. Y'all are awesome people. People. Thank you. All right. Well, we come back. We're going to have a quote. Yep. And we're going to answer a question from one of our aspiring leaders. So awesome. stand Love by. It. All right. We're back. We're still here with John Wink. And it's time for a question from one of our aspiring administrators in New Caney ISD. Let's go. So we're going to start with you today, John. What is one form of communication that you would start with to get staff all on the same page in the beginning of the year. Oh, this is this is going to be interesting because it's actually not your words. It's actually your walk. <clears throat> and so what I mean by that is um, people watch your mo- your walk more than they watch your talk. Sure. And so, you know, how you carry yourself, how you dress, you know, they're going to be watching to see if you loosen up on some expectations and, you know, what do Fridays look like for you? Um, in addition to that, they're going to watch your walk and how you deal with difficult situations. You know, people judge you not by your best moments, but by your worst situations. Sure. And so how you communicate in those difficult times really set the stage. So if you want to be a strong communicator, focus on you, on how you're going to carry yourself in all situations. Because at the end of the day, what people follow is they, cons- they follow consistency and they follow character. And if there's any variation in your consistency or your characters one way one day one day the next day they're eventually not going to know which leader they want to follow right. so that would be the it doesn't involve your words just yet start there and i promise you the words and the tone and all that other stuff will follow that's really insightful i think that's the same in the classroom you know yes. what i mean like you have your kids that first day of school you're starting off setting your expectations yep. letting everybody know what you're about and you got to be consistent so that you're effective and I will tell you, um, when I've hired leaders within a system that have moved up in that system, mm-hmm. I promise you their character and their consistency is the thing that brings them through. Because if you're random and you're up one day and down the next day, you've already interviewed yourself out of the job. You're always on an interview. 100%. Always on an interview. So when you say that is to me very insightful, John, in my mind, I thought you, you know, we might start with a Monday memo and a s'more. It's actually what goes unsaid is the biggest communication. Yep. And Ms. Schaffner is continually telling our leaders that you're always on an interview, yeah. always on an interview. She and sure so is. it doesn't matter um, where you're at. So the first form of communication, remember, is unspoken. Unbelievable. And goes un- it, it is not what is said or put in a s'more. Yep. I love that. That's, very good. That's very impactful and like super effective. Absolutely. I, I really like that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, before we close out the show, we've had such a great time having you on today. Do you have a quote that you'd like to end on? The one that keeps uh, the one that keeps coming to my head because I've been thinking about that since we talked. Sure. Um, And I cannot remember the place where I heard it, but I did hear it in a keynote and I I use it a lot. And it it comes back to being a servant. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is real important is to always remember if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. 
that's super if you're not powerful. willing to lead, if you're not willing to serve the people that you lead, then you're probably not the you're probably not the leader for them. Because at the end of the day, people follow servants; they don't follow leaders. So that would be my suggestion. That's really powerful. That that's is, I love that. That's very. I knew you would be. I knew you would be awesome, John. Thank you so I'm much. So glad you're here. Appreciate it. It has been a great visit, and of course, you're always welcome in New Caney ISD. And we're so glad to always work with you. And I can't wait to look to work with you this year. It's going to be a good year. It's Thank you, Dr. Slade. I appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, and we look forward to more great things that you're going to bring to New Caney ISD. Absolutely, I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.